Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live. I'm your host Viz and tonight our guests are writer-director Kurt Wimmer and our returning guest star Kate Moyer from the movie Children of the Corn which is premiering tomorrow March 3rd in theaters. Guys, welcome to the show. I hope you're doing well and before we get started, Kate, I really gotta tip my hat to you in this performance. You completely freaked me out we when you were on the show last year we sort of touched upon the movie but we couldn't talk too much about it having Mm. seen it now oh my god you were just so amazing kurt did she freak you out while she was in character at all no she freaked me out but i love i i i was uh i was just enraptured by her performance because she did such a great job and you know her her and i we really were a team we worked together you know it's crazy you know because you know i'm definitely a grown man she's a little girl but we were like we worked really well together you know we i didn't talk to her like a kid um we just you know spoke director and actor and we we just um did everything we could to you know to bring the performance to her and allow and capitalize on her tremendous strengths that I learned more and more about every day and the more I learned about them the more I would sort of alter the character to to uh, highlight those strengths I mean oh my god you gotta imagine I watch this movie and here's a girl that I spoke to last year the, <laughs> one of the nicest girls you'll ever meet and I'm absolutely terrified of her on the screen I mean, she is like the embodiment of evil. Now, Kurt, this movie has been delayed now for a while. Did you ever think that this movie would never see the light of day? Well, yeah. Well, you know, listen, we all went through this thing with COVID, right? I mean, theaters were closed. People were afraid to go. And it really wasn't until last summer, um, you know, that Maverick came out and, and people said, oh, OK, maybe the- maybe theatrical will be back. Which we all, all, and then the conversation could be it started to have about this movie. But but yeah, uh, you know, we we didn't know, Kate. I mean, like until a couple months ago, really, that uh, we didn't know. I mean, and it, and it, it's um, pretty unnerving to think that you put so much work in it. You go through such an adventure. I'll tell you, you know, whether we know or not that we were the we started shooting April 2020 um, and we were the only film shooting on Earth yeah. for the entirety of our shoot in April, May of 2020. So to go through all of that and then, you know, like, oh, maybe no one will ever see this movie. And, I, and me knowing that her, uh, Kate and Elena, did what I thought was such an amazing performance, I was like, God, what a, what a crime that would be. Yeah. So, yeah. I absolutely agree. You, uh, April 2020 was the start of the lockdown and people were locked away in their homes. Now, Kate, being a little bit older now, looking back on your performance with Eden, who is your character, uh, we heard Kurt explain it. How much of uh, influence help was Kurt with you in bringing out this amazing performance? I wouldn't say it wasn't so much as an influence as it was like a like a like a partner kind of thing or it was very collaborative. Um, we, we basically like when we were in, when I was in quarantine for two weeks, um, you know, we would have like zoom calls with Kurt, Elena and I, where we would just like ad lib and, you know, go through, try and get in the headspace of our characters before we went on set. So we weren't like figuring out, figuring it out on day one. Mm -hmm. Um, but also Kurt allowed me to have a lot of creative liberty when it came to Eden, because there was a lot of me that I put into Eden and I feel like that helped make it like more believable i gotta ask you though as a you know three years ago uh for someone in your generation your age group that's a lifetime okay so three years ago you were so much younger where did you draw upon the evilness from i gotta ask you (laughs) it's just it's always there you know in my brain no i'm kidding um i'm not really sure you know i i wasn't eden to me she was she was you know she was manipulative and she she kills people but she wasn't she wasn't like outwardly evil in my opinion the way i saw her because you know i i obviously have some bias where i know a little bit more background on her character and i I understand why she's come to this point and how she has but i feel like you know it wasn't it wasn't about you know you know like getting into this evil space it was about like merging myself with like the scene and how eden would emote exactly and this is a 
go on. Well, if I just add to that, if you don't mind, is, you know, I mean, I, let's be honest, uh, everybody uh, who gets it in this movie has it coming. Mm-hmm. You know, except Ashley and Sissy, I think. But, you know, they're, you know, they pass her pennies. You know, she's the guy who takes her in the foster home. You know, it's implied that there was abuse there. Um, everybody in this, the town's corrupt, yeah. you know. And, and um, so, you know, is it evil to punish evil? Yeah, yeah. And I do like, Kurt, that you do not only show one side of Eden. You do show us multiple uh, layers of her personality. Uh, and people are going to have to watch to find out exactly what I'm talking about. Now, Kurt, rebooting a classic film like this, um, any classic film, it's a slippery slope with fans. Uh, what gave you the confidence that you can tell, present this story in a way in the year, you know, in modern times that it can be successful again? Well, so, so that's an interesting question because it's it's not so much about confidence. I'm confident I can do it. I mean, you you never know how a movie's going to come out. I mean, you just there's so many unknowns. Mm-hmm. Like performance, environment, is it going to rain? You know, just, there's so many things. So, but but that, unfortunately, today, if you're going to make a movie. Uh, and you want people to see it, uh, they won't make it unless it's based on something else. You know, yeah. if, it's a, if, if it's a remake, a sequel, a prequel, um, and, and or it's based on a comic book. So, you know, that's kind of what a lot of what you ended up, the, the only choices you have on the menu. So, and, and then you, you know, then that, after that, it's the same process as making any film. You just have to, you know, um, you just have to go for it. You got to go for it. Give your own version, put the past in the past, the old version lives among itself and present an entirely different take on the story. That's right. And you know, it's funny because, you know, you get people out there, kids, they're fans, you know, they like what you say. The one I've, I've seen some things, they say, well, why isn't more, you know, and they haven't seen the movie, but where, where's Malachi? You know, there's no Malachi. I mean, that's, that's what it is. But like, there's been 11 of those, haven't there? You know, so I'm like, let's uh, let's let's do it up a little bit differently and create a new character. But also, what a lot of people don't realize is that Malachi is in this movie because Malachi doesn't live in this town. This town is not Gateland. This is Ralston, which yeah. is the neighboring town. And you know, it's implied that it's a prequel, and that that you know, that Kate says in the movie, you know, other kids in other towns are going to see what we've done, and they're going to take their town too because they're tired of having their future frittered away. And so the implication is that this is the powder keg yeah. that set out, but then spread to Gateland. Okay. So, you know, that's that's why there's no Malachi and there's no Isaac, because it's a different town. Awesome. Now, uh, Kate, Kurt gives us a more detailed explanation about what's going on, what could possibly be going on and is going on in those cornfields. Did you watch the original either when you booked the role before, after you booked it, to sort of get a background on the story, or did you want to go into this with a fresh mindset? Uh, this is this is gonna make some people angry, but I did not watch the first movie. I, I, I didn't, my horror pop culture is not as big as I, I, I hope it or wish it would be. Um, but I didn't really know what it was before and you know my parents they definitely filled me in of like the overarching story of all the movies um, mainly the first one and what it's about and I feel like you know while it definitely it would have helped me to watch the first movie I feel like it was also it benefited me that I didn't I agree yeah because I was able to you know create this character and I and I didn't feel pressured to, you know, conform to what, you know, other characters have done in the past. I feel like I could create this new character from a blank slate. Absolutely. Now, Kurt, like I said, you give us some more detailed insight to what may, to, to what is going on in those cornfields. Is that, was that your take from watching the original whenever you watched it and you wanted to give it to us in this film? Well, um, in, in some senses, yeah, because, um, you know, really, what, what, what I think my inspiration was the original source material, which Stephen King wrote in the 1970s. Um, but, you know, I was aware that there's a lot of talk in these movies about he who walks behind mm-hmm. the roads, but we never we never see him. And, you know, I, I, in one sense, I understand that it is a psychological conceit, you know, that it's it, it doesn't sometimes it's more powerful not to see him. But, you know, after 11 movies, 
maybe I thought maybe it's time, and especially if people are going to pay to go see the movie, or you know, you pay ten dollars to see the movie, or five dollars to rent it, or whatever it is. You know, let's entertain them. Yeah. Let's just let's stop messing around. Um, we've are, we, we, if, if they, they don't want to see them, they can watch those ten others. They can watch. If they do want to see them, now they have one. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, out of all the times this film has attached a title, I, I really like this one the best, you know, next to the original. Uh, now, Kate, uh, going back to your character, Eden, do you think Eden is controlled by the man who walks uh, the way it's stated in this film? Is she possessed, in your opinion, or just influenced by whatever's in those cornfields? See, there's the way Kurt wrote the script, there's a lot of mysteries. There's a lot of like, I, I know he wanted everyone to kind of leave the theater and be like, you know, asking questions because you don't want to watch a movie and like sometimes all the questions are answered yeah. and you don't dwell on it or think about it too much. So I think I'm not really sure because there's so many different theories or, you know, things that could be impacting Eden or if, you know, if is it a hallucination? Is she possessed? Is this, you know, is she the corn monster? I don't know. That's, that's, I, I'm not even completely sure. And it was three years ago. <laughs> well, let me interject. And, I, and I'm, I wrote it and I directed it. I'm not sure. I, I like not being sure. I like not knowing the answers. But there's a couple of things. First of all, you know, these kids were playing this, the cornfield is their playground. Yeah. And, but we all know it's dying. And we know this fungus, like these ergot, like funguses grow on dying crops that cause hallucinations. Bolin is clearly hallucinating at the beginning of the film. She talks about it. Um, so, you know, there's a question of whether that monster is real, you know, whether it's in a way it's like Puff the Magic Dragon, you know, it's like, is it her monster? Is the monster a manifestation of her id, you know, of, of the, all the bad things that have happened to her? Yeah. You know, is the monster something that, you know, out of trauma, she's manifested? That, yeah. and, um, and, and, you know, so, you know, is she influenced by the monster or is the monster created by her? Um, you know, because at the end she looks at him and says, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Because, and, and is she talking to the monster or is she talking to Earth itself? Like she failed. She was trying to, you know, Ian was trying to save Earth, basically. And Earth is, is the town that they live in, the corn. And she fails. You know, thanks, thanks, Bolin. Thanks, yeah. Bolin. But she fails and she, you know, she says, I'm sorry. And um, it's quite tragic, you know, to me. No, no. You know, you mentioned that that was a very sad moment when she says, I'm sorry, and she realizes that she failed in what she was supposed to ultimately accomplish. Uh, Kurt, do you have a lot of experience directing young actors? Uh, is this your first time having a whole set full of young actors? And um, how do you maintain control on the set? Uh, what, what, what a great question, first of all. I've worked with a couple uh, young actors. Um, to varying degrees of success, but nothing like nothing like the young lady you have here. I mean, this is like okay, you know, uh, I'll do this all day long. But I was concerned because you know we've all seen movies with lots of kids. You know, they always when they make movies like it or whatever, these kids are you know these are 15, 16 year olds, mm -hmm. um, and you know nobody casts eleven year olds uh, because it's so dangerous because mm -hmm. you just don't know what you're going to get because. You know, you know, do they have the maturity to to hold the screen? I mean, that's a big, big deal. You know, people like Al Pacino can do it. You know, but there's a lot of adults that can't do it. Yeah. And um, so it's charisma and it's self discipline. And then, but we need to have one. You know, we had lots of kids, and just one kid staring off in space or looking in the camera kills the entire shot. And but these kids, these kids were great. So. You know, it was like, okay, I, me and my first AD, Sean Hunter, we're about to become, you know, fourth grade teachers for the next three months or two and a half months. And so I was well aware of the danger. And I was, I was like, I don't know, man. But like I said, you just got to go for it. We're, fine. we're going for it. No. And uh, thank God. Thank God. And, you know, also Kate was great, too, because they looked to her they all learned how to act these kids some of them were non-actors we shot in australia some of them were non-actors and they but by the end they were all actors all of them and then I mean, they were that's how you know that monster's walking into the into the barn every one of those kids is acting like a true professional you know and that's very very difficult and a lot of them you know they learned to act from kate they yeah. by watching her they learned how to act it was really amazing they were all in acting school and they didn't know it 
and Kate didn't know she was a teacher, but <laughs> I, I, I observed it and it absolutely happened. Must have been magical. Now, Kate, you and Elena carry this film, basically. It really is the two of you. Um, did you know you that at that age, going back three, year, three years ago, that you would have this much added responsibility? Or at 11, it didn't really compute that you'd be, you know, part of carrying an entire film. I mean, it definitely did. You know, I was, I was, I was, I was definitely nervous, but I, I thought it would be a challenge for me because, you know, I, this would have been, this is the biggest role that I've ever had. And, you know, it's in Australia, it's far away. There's just great opportunities there. And I was, I was really excited because you know eden is like such a strong and like as kurt puts it go-getter mm -hmm. and um, i i feel that it was it would it was not only only an important um you know story to portray but you know it was a challenge for me as the actor now kate shooting a film a horror movie it's not scary when you're shooting it watching it is a whole different story what were your reactions when you watched the final the final product uh, well, near the end, um, I was kind of hiding behind my blanket the entire time because <laughs> I don't make horror movies. Um, but I was really happy with the way it came out because I could definitely see, you know, what Kurt was envisioning. And, you know, I think a, like a lot, all of the hard work really came together and it, it shows. Mm hmm Yeah, it does. Now, Kurt, Eden in the beginning of the film has a black, like, cowboy hat on. Is that a throwback to uh, the original uh, with, I believe it was Isaac and his black hat? Uh, or was it just well, no, coincidental? Oh, no, no. Well, you know, they they, they had kind of, uh, you know, and I, 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 you know, I'm just saying it because it's sort of for, uh, more of a, an old school Mennonite type hat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very different. This is she was wearing a cowboy hat because, you know, she's wearing cowboy boots and she has an actual gun holster, but it has flowers in it. Yeah. You know, because she's just. Well, you know, we'll do what kids doing what we did when we were kids. You know, you're playing dress ups, cowboys and Indians, or whatever it is. So that was so it, it really had nothing to do with the the original thing. And you know, the other thing is in the original movie, they wore those hats because you know they wore those vests and the white shirts. It was very much, uh, um, it was very much kind of uh, an, an Amish Amish and nothing against the Amish whatsoever. Um, but it was sort of an Amish influence thing. Yeah. But she was doing it as dress up because she's in her, she lives in this fantasy world. She's been through a lot of trauma, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of trauma. And so she expresses it by creating this big fantasy world out in the corn. But, you know, the adults are killing, they're destroying her playground. And so she fights back. She's, um, you know, she's, she's highly goal oriented girl. Absolutely. Uh, throughout the film, the, the term, the man, uh, in this film, the term is used, the man who walks. He uh, who walks. Yeah, exactly. He who walks. Uh, during that last scene when they're in the barn and Kate says again, he who walks. I really thought she was going to say the full 1984 line, he who walks behind the rose. But you didn't have her say it that way. Was it any reason in particular uh you wanted to shorten that line was it just to change yeah, things up well well yeah because it sounds better he who walks i mean it just says it says it all yeah. you know when you say when you say he who walks because usually that goes without saying that, that people walk mm -hmm. but when you say he who walks it means wait a minute he doesn't you know he doesn't usually walk what's going on <laughs> um it's kind of it's creepier so you know he who you know walks behind the rose or he who walks um you know to the store <laughs> it's like you, you, everything after he walks seems to me kind of unnecessary because okay. i'm scared already when you say he who walks i'm like uh i don't want to meet that guy oh yeah especially when it's coming from eden now kate <laughs> before we go I'll, I'll throw the last question to you how do you think this film is going to resonate with your generation of horror fans Ooh, okay well there there are like an unbelievable amount of layers and references and you know like issues that are kind of tackled or mentioned in this movie and i feel like it it makes the movie you know scarier because it it's so relevant in to, for issues today like environmental issues or you know like there's there's like intergenerational conflict like kurt has said before but um putting that aside there's also the um the, the, the main two characters Bo and Eden, they're, 
I find them other than the murdering part, they're they're pretty relatable characters. They they both have the same sort of goals and they they have different ways of getting them. And I feel like, you know, Eden's, you know, she's ambitious and she's determined. And I feel like, you know, I hope people can, you know, be inspired by that and apply it to their own lives. Well, she is definitely a powerful girl. <laughs> If I can just add to, I listen. I think kid, kids or the girls are going to look at it and they're going to really enjoy it because I, it's. Let's be clear. This is there's some wish fulfillment in this movie because what kid at all of us at some point in our life we would say like say God I'd like to kill my parents, yeah. you know. And so I think you know it's just like again I said earlier you know it's just like watching Scarface. We allow ourselves to go on that journey because you know we would all like to you know. Be like Tony Montana at a certain point. Absolutely. So I, I, I really think that kids are going to be like, uh, yeah, I can totally get behind that agenda. Yeah. You know, I think kids are going to. I think kids are going to love it because it shows kids being empowered, and you know, I totally see you know them falling in love with it. The movie was great. Congratulations to the to the both of you. You did a fantastic job. I really enjoyed this film. Again, Children of the Corn, guys. It's coming out tomorrow in theaters. Uh, and it's coming out later this month to On Demand. Definitely watch this film. You won't be disappointed. They'll be thrown off that there were so many other films bearing the name Children of the Corn. This is something completely different. Kurt, Kurt directed, wrote the film. Kate is the star. Congratulations again to the both of you. I want to thank our audience, those of you who are tuning in live, and those who will be watching this Later on, on behalf of Kurt Wimmer and Kate Moyer and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.